<laughs> this morning we're going to be looking at a very familiar passage in Old Testament, um, a prophecy that the Lord gave through Isaiah the prophet regarding who this one would be and what he would do. It was born so many years ago. Uh, you'll immediately recognize, I'm sure, even just the reference, Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. But what I'd like to do is back up to verse 1 and read through verse 7, and for us to understand that the Lord gives us through Isaiah in the context, as He often does through the prophet, <clears throat> or any of His prophets, in the context of judgment. God's people had sinned against Him. Uh, things were gloomy. If, if they hadn't sinned against Him, the Lord was certainly predicting that they would. But yet, whenever the Lord sends His prophets to warn His people, to tell them that they have fallen into sin and they need to repent, He also gives them this, this hope. Uh, he shines the light, as it were, the, of things that are coming ahead, of what He intends to do one day, which is to fulfill His promise to Israel to send His Messiah, to send His Son into the world in order to save them from their sins. And this is one of the clearest and one of the most glorious prophecies that the Lord gave to His people in those days, in the days of the divided kingdom. I believe Isaiah, perhaps at this time, was ministering under Josiah the king, the southern kingdom of Judah. And it was through Judah that Messiah was going to come. So they seem to have gotten more of these uh, paintings, these pictures of hope. But just see what kind of hope this would have brought you if you happened to be in their shoes in those days in the darkness of sin and judgment. This is what the Lord says through Isaiah in chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of, of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious. By the way of the sea, on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation, you shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence as with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, as at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult, and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning, fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of His government or of peace on the throne of David and over His kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. May the Lord bless His word to our hearing this morning. Now, I don't think I need to tell you that this morning we're looking at perhaps the most familiar subject that the church is aware of, the birth of Christ, one that many other churches today throughout our city, throughout our state and country and throughout the world will focus on because we're so close to Christmas Day, the birth of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, our Redeemer. Now, again, as I was thinking about what to deal with uh, on this particular morning as we're thinking about the birth of Christ, I mean, there's so many things we could consider about His birth if we had the times. Certainly, we could consider the fact that God had promised to send Him into the world as early as the fall when Adam and Eve needed hope that everything was going to turn out well in the end after the tragic choice that they had made to sin against God and really to plunge the whole human race into sin and misery. That's the reason why we have the difficulties that we have. But from the very beginning, God gave them hope that He would send the Savior into the world. We could look at how the Lord had renewed this promise again and again throughout the Old Testament Scriptures from that time that He gave that prophecy to Adam and Eve until the time He was actually born to encourage His people to put their trust 
in Him. We could look at many other prophecies in Scripture regarding Him and their fulfillment, such as how He would be born of a virgin, how He would be born in the town of Bethlehem. In our passage, we see that He would be in the line of David. Even that He would flee into Egypt in order to escape Herod's attempt to kill Him, but how they would later return to Israel and settle in Nazareth. Now, again, all these things would make, I think, a very interesting study. And I think would prove beyond any reasonable doubt that Jesus Christ is, in fact, who He said He is, the only Savior of mankind. But what I would like us to focus on this morning is what this particular prophecy tells us about Jesus and what He came into the world to do. Because I hope you understand that your eternal destination, the eternal destination of each one of us depends on how we respond to what these verses actually say. So really what I want us to do is look at two things, what they tell us about Jesus as far as who He is, and then secondly about what He came into the world to do and what difference it makes or what difference it should make in, in our lives. Now the first thing they tell us is who this one is that was to be born. I think you'll agree with me that He was to be no ordinary child. I've already told you that His coming into the world was so important that God began to speak about it from the very beginning, from the fall of Adam and Eve, right after they had sinned, right after they had fallen away from Him. Now, the fact that He was to be born means that this one would be one of us. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. He would be a part of the human race. Now, I want you to understand that Jesus, to be our Savior, had to be a part of the human race because man sins. Adam and Eve sinned. You and I have sinned. We are the ones who actually owe this debt. And the Bible tells us quite clearly the debt is death. The wages of sin is death. And this isn't just the death that we die. We all know that we're going to grow old and die someday. Everyone dies. There's no exception to that at all. But it's referring really mainly to what happens to us after we die. After we die, we have to pay for those sins. If we haven't trusted the Savior that God sent, the only Savior of the world, we have to pay for those sins. God will exact His justice on us, which means we will continue to exist but our existence won't be very pleasant. We'll actually be in a place, <clears throat> the Bible says, is like a place that burns with fire and feels like fire, probably because it is fire, some kind of a fire that can hurt our souls and we'll be tormented day and night. That is the wages of sin. That is what we have earned by our sins. But you see, the point is, we are the ones who committed those sins. We have committed those crimes against God. We are the ones who owe the debt. So the one who would save us must be a man. He must be one with us so that he could make that payment for us from our side. He had to be one who could obey for us. And he had to be one who could die for us. Now, this one, in order to do this, of course, could not be an ordinary man, as we've already seen. He was no ordinary man. God had been telling us about this one from the very beginning that He was going to sin in the world. And why is it that He could not be ordinary? Well, it's because, for one thing, if He were ordinary like us, He would be under the same curse and He wouldn't be able to save us. But there's another very important reason, and that is because the crimes that we have committed are infinitely serious. Every time we've broken one of God's commandments, we've actually committed a crime, but the crimes we've committed are not just against one another, they're against God. And God is infinitely holy and infinitely offended. You see, the severity of any crime depends upon the one against, against whom we commit it. It's one thing to punch your neighbor in the eye, it's another thing to punch the president, or another thing, let's say, to punch the king of a country. You're going to be punished much more severely for that because of the honor of his office and the worthiness, as it were, of his person. What happens if you punch God in the eye? 
Well, thankfully, you can't do that. But when you sin, you offend him. And those offenses are very grievous. So the one who would make this payment has to be valuable enough to be able to pay for the crimes that we have committed against God himself. So this one who was born is, was to be one with us. He is to be a human being, a part of the human race. But he was much more than that. He had to be much more than that. He had to be God in human flesh because only one who is infinitely worthy could pay for the crimes that you and I have committed against him. But you see, that's exactly what Isaiah said, that this child would be not just man, but also God. I mean, notice what his names are. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And I'm going to draw your attention primarily to the two middle names, Mighty God and Eternal Father. Now, let me just say, Eternal Father doesn't mean that He is the Eternal Father as though the Son is the Father. We do believe that they are two separate persons. But more accurately, this should be translated, the Father of Eternity. This one who is coming into the world is one who is eternal. This one is, as Isaiah tells us, none other than the Son of God Himself. So this babe who uh, is predicted here to be born so many years later, but one whom we know has already been born, born in that cattle stall, laid in the manger, was no mere man. He is the eternal Son of God who became a man. And as a man, He obeyed and He died so that if you or anyone else would only put your trust in Him, if you would place your whole hope of entering into heaven upon what He has done, you will be saved. Now that, as I've said, is the work of our Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. But the second thing these verses tell us is what He came into the world to do. Now, I've already answered that question in part. We know that He came to live. We know that He came to die so that all who trust in Him might be saved. But we've already, already seen, as it say, that this isn't all that He came into the world to do. Jesus also came to rule. He is not only a savior from sin, he is also the Lord. Notice what Isaiah says, the government would rest on his shoulders. <clears throat> he is the child that God has promised to David, the one who would reign on his throne and over his kingdom. Now we might be tempted to think from what Isaiah says here that Jesus came into the world merely to rule over the land of Israel, and there's a lot of people who actually believe that that is the case, but you need to understand it's much more than that. He came to rule over the world. He came to rule over the universe. As a matter of fact, Zechariah tells us as much in another one of the prophecies concerning Jesus Christ that he would ride into Jerusalem presenting himself as the king of Israel on a donkey, and of course Israel rejects him and so forth, and but in doing so, fulfills what the Lord actually intended, that he would be put to death by the hands of wicked men. By that death, he would make a payment, an atonement for sins, but also he would be elevated to the place of greatest authority. Let me read what Zechariah says in Zechariah 9, verses 9 through 10. You'll recognize it immediately, but we don't often connect the verses that follow with this passage. He says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the bow of war will be cut off, and he will speak peace to the nations, and his dominion will be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. I want you to notice that this king was uh, going to reign not just over Jerusalem, but over the entire world, and that his reign would bring peace. Cut off the chariot, the horse, the bow of war, speak peace to the nations. 
Now, the Bible tells us that after Jesus died on the cross and he rose again from the dead on the third day and appeared to his disciples, over 500 at one time, who saw him alive after his crucifixion. He then ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time on until his enemies are subdued under his feet. That's what we read in Psalm 110. But we also see the author to the Hebrews applying it specifically to Jesus in Hebrews chapter 10. Now this is what the Father actually promised to His Son Jesus Christ for the work that He would do. Not only that He would give Him all who would put their trust in Him, but that one day every knee would bow to Him of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Now, let me suggest to you that that's the reason why he, one of his names that he would be called by would be the Prince of Peace. And that's why Isaiah said there would be no end to the increase of his government. It may start small, but it increases in power. There would be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. You see, the submission of his enemies to his rule, the subjection of them will bring peace. Now, the Father has given to Jesus all power and authority in heaven and earth, which is why Jesus gave His church the commission that He did. And the Father entrusted Jesus, and again, not just the Son of God, but the Son of God made man our Redeemer, our Mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who sits at the right hand of God. He entrusted Him with all authority, not only so that He can rule and overrule everything for the good of His church, but that he might have absolute control over the world so that she would be sure to complete her work and be kept safe through it and eventually arrive in heaven. That he might establish God's rule, that he might uphold God's kingdom with righteousness and justice from then until the very end of time. So this child who was born of the virgin almost 2,000 years ago is not only God in human flesh, he's not only the savior of mankind, but he is, as he's called in the book of Revelation, the king of kings, which means he is the king over all kings. And he is the Lord of lords, which means he is the Lord over all lords. Everyone is under his authority. He has all power and authority entrusted to him. Jesus is Savior, and He is King. Now, what does all this mean for you? What does it mean for me? Well, it means, first of all, that if you want to see heaven, if you want to arrive in heaven and not hell, then you do need to trust Him. You do need to place your whole hope of heaven upon Him because He is the only Savior that God has provided. You need to agree with Him about what God says about you and what He says about me. You have all sinned. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You cannot make it to heaven on your own. You can never be good enough because not only have you failed to give to God the perfect obedience that you need to get into heaven, but you would never be able to pay for even one sin, the price for even one sin because the price is infinite. I think the simplest way to prove that you could never make it to heaven on your own is to consider the fact that God sent His Son in the first place. I mean, why would the Father send His Son into this world, into a sinful and hostile world that hated Him? Why would He make Him submit to His law from birth to death and put Him through such an agonizing death on the cross? even pouring out His wrath against His Son. Why would He do that if you or anyone else could simply come to God on your own apart from Jesus Christ? Paul, seeing this, knowing it very well, writes in Galatians 2.21, if righteousness comes through the law, that is, if it came through obedience, your obedience, then Christ died needlessly. If you could save yourself by your own works, then Christ died for nothing, which would be infinitely cruel of the Father to put His Son through this if it wasn't necessary. 
I mean, Jesus even prayed in the garden as he was looking forward to the, what he was going to have to suffer and not just the physical pain on the cross, but the wrath of his father poured out against him on the cross. Jesus sweat blood. And he said, Father, if it's possible, if you're willing, let this cup pass from me. I mean, Jesus didn't want to go through all that agony if it wasn't necessary, but he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And he went through it because it was necessary. Jesus is the only way to God, the only way to be reconciled with God. That's what Jesus himself said. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Peter tells us there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. You see, if you want to see heaven, you have to turn from your sins and you have to trust Jesus because He is the only Savior. But there's something else you need to do as well, and that is we would say the evidence that you have trusted Jesus, but something the Bible insists on and something which we've already talked about, you need to obey Him. Jesus didn't come only to save. He came to rule. If you would see heaven, you need to submit to this rule. You see, you can't just do whatever you want to. You can't continue as a rebel against God. You have to bow the knee. Now, does that sound unreasonable to you? It does to some people. That Jesus is the absolute king, has absolute rule, and you need to submit absolutely to him. I, I was reminded of a very good illustration of the problem and the solution to the problem in the movie Chariots of Fire, which we saw not too long ago and as, a, as we had a movie night and we're trying to bring the spiritual aspects of the movie out. And that movie, as you remember, was based on the life of two men, but Eric Little in particular, his his friend, Sandy McGrath, who also happened to be his coach, was speaking with Eric's father after a church service, and he says, it sounds to me like Christianity is a dictatorship. And Little's father agreed. He says, yes, yes, it is a dictatorship, but he is a benign and benevolent dictator. Now, that's what makes his rule so good and any reluctance on our part to submit to it so sinful. Now, Isaiah tells us that his government, his rule, is what's going to bring ultimate peace. But you can't have peace without justice. You can't have peace without righteousness. And you can't have justice or righteousness without one who can ensure that both are going to be carried out, without one who can enforce it. But that's exactly what this king does. He rules with justice, and his laws are the very definition of what is good and what is right, which is why it is so sinful for us not to submit to what this king tells us to do. You see, if you would see heaven, you need to repent. That's what it means. You know, when you say you submit to the king, you, that's what repentance is. You stop rebelling against him, and you begin to submit to him. That's what you need to do if you are to see heaven. You must not only trust Him, but you need to repent. You need to submit to Him. You need to do those things that show Him love and honor and the things that are good and loving towards your neighbor. Now, as I've said, when you do that, you're not earning your way to heaven. What you're doing is you're showing that His kingdom has already come into your heart, that you are a true believer because of your willingness to submit to the king, the king of righteousness. So yes, Jesus is a dictator that you need to submit to, but he is a good and gracious dictator. Not only is he the one for whose sake you have been given every good thing that you have and through whom you have been given everything that you've had from the time that you came into the world to the present, not only is what Jesus requires you, or requires of you good and right, but this gracious and benevolent dictator is also willing to forgive all the crimes that you have committed against him, every single one of them, no matter how severe they are. If you are willing to turn from your sins, trust in him, submit to him. 
So I'd ask you this morning, is Jesus your Savior? Have you trusted Him alone to save you? But is He also your Lord? If you don't bow the knee to Him, He really is no, not your Savior either because He's a Savior not only from the guilt of sin, but from the power of sin that is in your life. Jesus came into the world to break that power and to set you free. So is He your Savior and your Lord? If He isn't, I would invite you to turn from your sins this morning and to trust in Him. Don't let another reminder of His mercy and of His grace towards you pass you by without receiving His gracious offer of complete pardon and acceptance into His family. Turn from your sins and trust Him alone to save you and then purpose to follow Him as your King all the days of your life. And this Savior and this King will make sure that you arrive safely in heaven. Well, may the Lord grant to each of us the grace to love this King, to receive this King, to trust in this King, but also to submit to this King because we really cannot know that we know Him unless we submit to Him in everything. Well, let's bow in just a moment, uh, for a few moments of prayer and let's ask that the Lord might apply His Word to our lives as we really do need to hear it.